At this point in time, there's around 20 tunnels carrying either cars or railways under the Thames. You've probably heard of Mark Brunel's Thames Tunnel just to our west down the river. Mark Brunel, father of the Great Britain, Isambard Kingdom Brunel. But what came before that? And why did it take till 1843 to build a tunnel under a navigable river? My name is Paul and this is the story of the failed Thames Tunnels. Now by and large, London sits on a bunch of clay, so tunnelling isn't that tricky compared to some geology in the country. So when Ralph Dodd saw military advantage in building a tunnel under the Thames, well he saw great opportunity to put his engineering skills to the test. His confidence wasn't hugely unfounded. The year 1798, canal tunnels are propping up all over the country, so to build one under the Thames, that shouldn't cause too much concern, should it? And then why did it take another 50 years and some groundbreaking inventions to build a tunnel under the Thames? So Ralph Dodd really sold this on the basis of war, and he did so down in Gravesend. The great and the good of Kent and Essex. The idea being that you could march troops rapidly without needing to expose soldiers on an open boat. Now Dodd was a fairly flamboyant character it seems and he certainly had friends in high places because despite significant objection from the Ordnance Office, 1799 construction started certainly with the backing of the military. Now for the next three years there is nothing but disaster for Dodd and his team. The first shaft was sunk 800 yards to the east of Tilbury Fort and almost immediately flooding occurred. In 1800 newspapers reported that the quicksands had been discovered and they will render any project impracticable. At least that's what I think this newspaper clipping says. 1801 and steam driven pumps and digging machines were employed. Soon enough, pumping was abandoned in 1802 and the entire project drew to a close soon after. £15,000 expended and Dodd's dream of the first tunnel under a river was over. Less than a year has passed and we're now back in London. Robert Vasey is talking about the idea of transporting goods from one side of the Thames to the other swiftly because the wharfs here are propping up all over the place. Rotherhive and Limehouse across the way is the location and a tunnel is back on the cards. September 1803 and the press are starting to discuss this tunnel once again. Within just 18 months, the Thames Archway Company was born, the Vasey family amongst some of the shareholders. Well, I thought those stairs that I was just stood on were the stairs of the approximate location of this failed tunnel. But it turns out they're pageant stairs and we need to go back the way we came, about 100, 200 feet to uh, horse ferry stairs. According to the old maps, almost exactly here. Hmm. Almost exactly here should be Horse Ferry Stairs. But they're no longer here and instead we've got Sovereign Crescent. So we're probably stood right on top of the exact tun uh, location of where the tunnel was going to be built. So let's head 315 feet inland and we'll show you the position of the first shaft. 879, don't put me off, I'm counting 315 steps inland. Okay, I think it's just across the road under that building. Why don't we just put this on a map instead? The first shaft that Vasey sunk was just 315 feet from the shore to the south, which on the face of it seems rather close, but nevertheless 11 feet diameter shaft was attempted. Now reports from early 1806 indicate that barely 40 foot depth had been reached and instead of 11 foot diameter we're now looking at 8 foot. Vasey pinned this early lack of success on the ineffectiveness of the pumps. He'd uh, been supplied 16 horsepower when actually he requested 50 horsepower. Early 1807 and no reports of progress. Now bear in mind we haven't even started considering going horizontal as yet. All the issues seem to be in actually sinking just a shaft in its own right. 
So how exactly can we fix this? A trip to the pub. In fact, the globe in Fleet Street seemed to be the cure on more than one occasion. Perhaps a pressure was beginning to be applied to Vasey. If that was the case, Vasey's next move probably wasn't its finest. August 1807 and Vasey introduced Richard Trevithick to the board. Now there is a name you may well have heard before. You may not have heard of him for his mining fame. Yep, Trevor Fick was a Cornish mine builder down in South West England, and well, he could build tunnels. Well, mines. But same difference when you want to build a driftway under the Thames. September 1807, and they had just started on their driftway. Vasey and Trevor Fick now acting as joint engineers, and by September the 12th, they'd reached 180 foot from the shaft northwards. The driftway was five foot high, three foot wide at the bottom, and two foot six wide at the top. Proper mine drift, supported by proper mine beams and stuff. Just one month on, 1807, October the 19th, and we're now underwater. Reports suggest 394 feet from the initial shaft. Now, if you're a director of the Thames Archway Company, well, you're probably thinking, Trivovic is a genius. Vasey, not so much. And with that, they promptly sacked him. Harsh, but you can see their point in the cold light of day. So we're now leading up to Christmas 1807 and there's reports in the papers of significant leaks to the degree that an iron pipe has to be installed in the driftway to help remove some of the quicksand. Now, it's seemingly successful because at this point, we're 948 feet from the shaft across the river. So let's plot that on a map and see exactly where we are in relation to the shoreline here at Limehouse. Pretty close it seems indeed, almost all the way across the water. What could possibly go wrong? Early 1808, and they are now just 160 foot from what they refer to as their Limehouse Terminus, presumably another shaft on the north side of the river. Disaster struck yet again, and water was pumped out time and time again. It seemed that the geology on this north side of the Thames wasn't as forgiving as the south side. The directors by this time got a little twitchy, it seemed, even insofar as organising a competition for the tunnel. How should we build a tunnel under the Thames? Despite being just 160 foot from their goal, after a significant consultation with a number of popular engineers of the time, well, they decided to pull the plug. So that was pretty much it for the first failed attempt under the Thames. Now, from that point forward, Mark Brunel did indeed pick up the ball, but it would take him another 30 to 35 years to complete that tunnel under the Thames, the first a tunnel under a navigable river. That's a story for another day, which we will tell on this channel, but not today. If you've enjoyed this video and you like what we do, maybe consider hitting the like button below, subscribe. And if you really like the content we do on this channel, maybe consider becoming a patron or hitting the join button below for some extra content. Speaking of extra content, before we sign off, some little outtake. See you next week. Okay. Let's <laughs> do <See> that again. <laughs> <laughs>